The art spots on calligraphy, textiles, and books and painting refer to the love of ornament in Islam. This spot focuses on the abundant use of geometry to decorate flat surfaces and in three-dimensional space. But first, we'll take a look at geometry's many practical applications, which involved considerable mathematical knowledge for navigation, telling time, and building and orienting large structures. One consequence of this was the development of a very expert group of astronomers, mathematicians, and engineers. The other result was a widespread appreciation for geometry among educated people. To be educated meant to be conversant in theology, poetry, grammar, but also math. Geometry had a practical application in determining the orientation of prayer. Of course, to orient a mosque or determine which way to pray, you could use a magnetic compass. But the magnetic compass, which was originated in China, was not adopted by Muslims until about the 12th century or later. Instead, direction and distance were calculated using geometry, observing the stars, and using instruments such as astrolabes, and eventually making detailed maps, such as this one based on a 16th century Turkish map. I discuss astrolabes and this map in the Trade and Travel Art Spot. The issue of determining the correct orientation for prayer had to be addressed in every mosque, in every place from the 7th century to the present. And there were imperfect calculations, and some early mosques were off kilter. And people worried profoundly about this. You can read some of the questions that people in history asked about the correct and incorrect orientation of their mosques by looking at the Muslim Journeys website. Geometry required mathematical knowledge, but once learned, it provided visual pleasure. Geometrical patterns have an underlying numerical logic that was recognized, understood, and appreciated by the viewing public. And one place where we see the appreciation of mathematics in the visual arts is in architecture, in surface ornament, and spatial planning. A geometrical pattern starts with a basic shape, like a circle or square, and then it's rotated or interlaced so that more complex forms are made. Thus, from a simple rectangle, a star can be formed. Patterns based on this kind of numerical manipulation could start with a pattern based on the number three. Think of triangles that become six-pointed stars. Or four, think of a rotated square that becomes an eight-sided figure. Or even five. Geometrical forms based on the number five were the most challenging. In the brick surface of this facade, the artisan's geometrical dexterity was such that six, nine, and twelve-sided figures emerge from the same field. When interconnected, these regular polygons and stars also create intermediary shapes that may appear irregular, and yet they are formed by the same rational and geometrical principles as the primary shapes. What amazes me in looking at a design like this is that it's made of plain brick and glazed tile, very ordinary materials. A brick is a simple rectangle, but instead of that rectangular form driving the composition, the artist managed to rotate it so that from the rectangle, octagons and star shapes emerge. Geometrical ornament plays with numbers, but it also plays with the relationship between figure and its background. When a marble screen in an Indian tomb was carved with white marble contrasting with the dark void of the emptiness between, it's hard to know which of the geometrical patterns we're supposed to focus on. The white and the black seem mutually dependent, yet one is solid form and the other is simply air. Geometrical principles for generating ornament may seem inflexible, but in fact there was astounding variety and freedom. Here we are looking at the mosque and mausoleum complex in Natanz, Iran, mostly dating to the 14th century. It has an exuberant array of geometrical ornament. In a single framed arch on its facade, a variety of patterns and colors were used. The different shapes made by the overlapping circles in bare brick in the center area are colored with turquoise and dark blue to make them stand out more sharply. The panel is then framed by a thin border of six-pointed stars in blue, turquoise, and white. Around this is a rectangular band of inscription in turquoise tile. And alongside is a half column, the tile design of which, like the center, is generated by overlapping circles. But the Islamic fascination with geometry wasn't confined to surface patterns, it also gave shape to space. Geometry was especially important in constructing domes. Here in the Great Mosque of Cordoba in southern Spain, there is a dazzling mosaic dome over the mihrab. That's the niche that orients prayer. 
The dome overhead is supported by arches, called ribs, that give structural support. They span the corners of the square base and allow the square to become an eight-sided shape that can better support the dome overhead. We can understand what the ribs are doing functionally here and appreciate the logic of the structure and the beauty of the mosaic. But the pleasure is increased when we see that for no other reason than the delight of playing with geometry, the ribs of the side domes have a different scheme. One of the dizzying effects of geometry was to take something very simple, such as the interlacing rectangle or a small niche shape, and to repeat it so many times that the eye no longer perceives the initial form, but instead becomes immersed in the overall design. Ornament called mucarnas is made this way. It is assembled from many small niche-like shapes that are pieced together like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle that can curve horizontally and vertically. Returning to the Natanz complex, we see a projecting cornice that wraps around the minaret towards its top. It provides the support for what would have been the floor of a small balcony, as could have been used for the call to prayer. The cornice rests on a band of mucarnas. If you look analytically at the mucarnas, you can see that it produces a profusion of ornament at the place where the form is in transition from the vertical shaft of the minaret to the horizontal floor of the balcony. With its dazzling array of repeating units, mucarnas forms a curved surface that masks the transition from one plane to the other. In the Natanz mausoleum, we also find mucarnas used for the interior of a high dome and filling the half dome of an arch over a major doorway. One of the most glorious examples of a mucarnas comes from the 14th century Alhambra Palace in Granada, Spain. The mucarnas has such a powerful effect that when it is used to fill the inner surface of a dome, all rational understanding of dome construction flies out the window. Instead of thinking logically with the mind to discern how the dome is supported and where and when the dome shifts from rising vertically to crossing horizontally, the eyes and the imagination take over. In looking at this dome, we suspend our logical way of thinking, our ability to understand the dome rationally, and give in to a purely perceptual appreciation of it. How high is the dome? How steeply pitched is it? We have no idea. It simply bursts overhead like fireworks, and below we stand in awe. This is how Mucarnas ornament is most often employed, as a distraction to overwhelm the eyes and pry the imagination away from the rational mind. In this way, Islamic art, through geometry, often plays with the viewer's ability to see the numerical logic of the ornament. Islamic art, of course, has this wonderful exuberant ornament, and it is very attractive to the eye. We love looking at it, and we think of it really as sort of pure visual enjoyment, as something that is purely decorative. But we should remember that it has an intellectual component as well, because underlying those patterns and those dazzling designs, there are combinations of numbers that are multiplied and carefully overlapped and intersected to form those very complex patterns that appeal to the eye, but also engage the mind. Islamic Art Spots are a presentation of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Bridging Cultures Bookshelf Muslim Journeys is a presentation of the National Endowment for the Humanities in cooperation with the American Library Association. Support for this program was provided by a grant from Carnegie Corporation of New York with additional support for art and media components from the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. To further explore the Islamic art spots and the Bridging Cultures Bookshelf Muslim Journeys, visit the Muslim Journeys website.